This video is going to show you a compendium, interesting word, huh? Of all the various pieces of literature published by Graham Page Motors Corporation concerning the 1938 through 1940 Spirit of Motion Grahams, which are commonly called shark noses by the public. What's been presented before you is a bunch of the brochures added up one at a time, and we're going to explain them as we go through here. This particular brochure is the 1938 Graham brochure. It's the first brochure on the Spirit of Motion. This one's in pretty pristine condition. Shows you the car in general and the features of the car. Two things to note, 1938, you have running boards on the car. They were standard in that year. Another thing to note, as this is opened up, is you're gonna see there are two versions of the car pictured. One is the ubiquitous four-door sedan that everybody's familiar with, but in the lower right-hand corner, you may have noticed there was a two-door coupe. That particular coupe, which we're coming up on again here possibly in a moment, actually was never manufactured by the factory. Believe it or not, somebody said they'd come up with this really nice idea for a coupe like that as a hot rod. Actually, they were well aware of the 1938 brochure and basically copied it made an interesting hot rod that way and won a very special award that way. Gives you the specifications. For the three years, the specifications are largely similar. We're gonna show some differences as we go year to year and you will see some changes in the cars. This is the 1939 brochure. All of the grams that I have are in fact 39s. I have also owned a 38 and am more than familiar with the 40s. The 39 brochure, as you can see, is more colorful. It's uh, quite different in presentation, trying to be very avant-garde, promoting airplanes and pushing the look of the car a little bit. However, as people may already know, the car was pretty much a flop in 1938. 39 was not exactly a big improvement for them. You'll see the brochure is presented quite differently. This particular brochure is well worn, but I wouldn't want to put scotch tape on it and change it. You'll notice there are three versions of the car now. There's a combination coupe on the left, a two-door sedan on the right, and of course the four-door sedan. People used to tell me the two-door sedan didn't exist. I have a combination coupe, a two-door sedan, and a four-door sedan, and they're all factory cars. The car was never available in red, which makes this particular folding center on this brochure interesting. Not at any time during the three year production of the Spirit of Motion cars did Graham actually have the car available in red. So don't ask me why they put it in red in the brochure, obviously to catch attention, but they never built them that way. Couldn't even special order them in that color. The series of colors was never that bright in the 1930s. Here we have the presentation as we fold the folder over. It's significantly more detailed than the 1938 brochure, probably fearing that providing the extra detail would really push the cars. You notice they really worked on selling the superchargers. This was not on the basic car. You got it as part of the Supercharger Equipment Group in 1939. They told you right there all the things you were getting for the dollars you were spending. You could get the basic car. You get the car equipped with Custom Equipment Group, which is pretty much an appearance group, or you could get the car with the Supercharger Equipment Group. However, the car could also be ordered with the Custom and Supercharger Equipment Groups at the same time resulting in the car properly being called a custom supercharger and a model 97. The steering wheel on the left is the standard steering wheel, the steering wheel on the right, the banjo steering wheel is on custom cars or it could be ordered as the steering wheel itself. Also, even though you can't tell in this particular shot, they offered overdrive at the time. Just to let you know, you can always pause this and look closer at the brochures at any time you want to. Now that particular brochure that's been placed in front of you is Graham for 1940. 
1940, Graham tried to soften the front end of the car, make it less of the, quote, shark nose designs. The front end of the car is radically different. All three years also feature different bumper styles. If you've been noticing, the least attractive appears to me to be the 1940. The best looking bumper style appears to be actually a 1930. The color brochure featured here is the last color brochure known from Graham. You notice the perspective is pretty poor in the drawings, not the best artist who did that. And I do mean that seriously, the perspective doesn't make the car fronts look right. They're showing you both the Hollywood and what was known in 1940 as the senior cars. Those were the spirit of motion cars. They were on the way to being phased out in favor of producing the Hollywood. The spirit of motion is shown here, still shown as a four-door sedan. That's pretty much what they produce with them. You'll see the interior is much fancier than previous years and actually comes in multiple colors. So they gussied up the interior, figuring that would sell the car better, changed the angle of the front grille section, thinking that would sell better. Didn't do any good for them in either case, but those were changes that they made to try to bring a more modern look to the car in its third year of production. As we go over here and look at the rest of the brochure, you're going to see that they pushed the other body styles as we go along where we have the two-door sedan and the combination coupe. Again, all three of those styles were actually available. The two-door sedan is exceedingly rare. To my knowledge, the one I have and the one other one I purchased that was a rusty basket case are the only two I'm aware of that are in existence. There's another unique thing in this brochure that we haven't gotten to and hopefully Mr. Frisch is going to flip to it for us is a different body style we have not yet seen. This particular body style you see here is the combination coupe. The combination coupe has a lengthened rear deck, shortened passenger compartment, so there is less room inside but still sits six people. The two-door sedan has the full length roof, longer rear windows, all the room that's in the regular four-door sedan, but it has the two-door look and I think the long roof car is actually the prettiest of the three. Now what we may not get featured here is the convertible. There was never a convertible made by the factory, although they at times did picture one. And the convertible was supposedly produced in 1940. Again, it was never actually produced. There is a fake convertible running around, sold a few years ago by Hyman Limited, originally sold by Barrett Jackson. And it is actually a car that was converted sometime after it was produced by the factory into a convertible. How do you know it's not factory? That particular car, if you remove the panels on the interior rear of the car, you will find out that that car was made from a four-door sedan. They welded the door shut. Now, if anybody thinks about this for a minute, why would a company that had two-door sedans and two-door combination coupes with long doors that allowed you to get in the back seat ever produce a two-door convertible using the short sedan doors so you couldn't get in the back seat so you know it's not a factory car. There you're seeing the Graham Hollywood and Graham Clifford. They're also pictured in the 1940 brochure. Of course, they're not spirit of motion cars, but they are Graham cars. The Clipper was to be the low line version of the Hollywood with an unsupercharged engine. Car was never built in that format. It wouldn't have made any money. They did make a couple of the actual Hollywood convertibles as you see pictured here and at least one of them has survived and been restored and I believe right now is in the Auburn Corps Duesenberg Museum in Auburn, Indiana. Absolutely beautiful car in person, it's dark blue. And as I said, the Clipper was supposed to be the unsupercharged price leader, but it was not actually produced. The cars that were produced as Hollywoods were in fact supercharged cars. You're seeing the engine there with this weird arrangement with the top of the supercharger. That was never actually done. That was what they thought they'd have to do to clear the hood. They did not actually make the car in the format you see in that particular drawing. There also were no clipper convertibles. Again, the cars were supercharged. They were all Hollywoods that were actually constructed. The Hollywood Graham, for those who do not know, is in fact 
The cord die bodies purchased by Norman DeVoe, who then tried to get Hupmobile to build the car. Hupmobile was incapable due to financial problems as well as the complexity of the cord dies to actually put the car into production. Hupmobile then approached Graham and uh, actually, I should correct that was actually Joseph Graham approached Hupmobile and asked him about having a version of the car for themselves if they could make the cars for Hupmobile at the same time. That they did. Graham Hollywood's used Graham engines, Hupmobile Skylarks used Hupmobile engines. And they were all built at the Graham plant except for a few hand built copies built at Hupmobile before production was started. The companies never did merge, regardless of what you'll see from anybody on the internet. They were never merged companies. They were two completely separate corporations. Here we have a very high quality, because of its surviving nature, copy of one. That's what your Graham identification card looked like when you got your new Graham car. But this is an actual 1939 Graham owner's manual. The owner's manual is reasonably complete in beautiful condition, tells you about all the features of the car. And as I've noted in other videos, you may not know what the items are, but at least the manual told you what they were because they weren't labeled in the car and you're supposed to know that. They also tell you about the operation of the shift, lubrication of the car, various adjustments to the car, how to take care of the finish, the interior, etc. Uh, Ms. Trish will not show you every single thing here, but it will show you some idea of what's in the manual. It's a fairly good manual. It's interesting, manuals start out being pretty fantastic when cars first came out. They kind of got crummy, I think, in some cases in the 1920s. And they seem to get better towards the mid to late 30s, where they told you a lot more about the car. Again, so that you could keep it in good repair and good working order. That particular drawing shows you every lubrication point you can find on that car. Unlike a modern car, that's a lot of stuff to lubricate. Right here you're seeing a little bit on the carburetors. The carburetors, four grams at the time, were Marvel carburetors. The joke is it's a marvel if it works, although those carburetors are possible to restore and make operational. Here you have your wiring diagrams that show you the setups between a standard car and between a car which you would call loaded, a custom supercharger. Even show you how to aim your headlights, for example, in the book. And every new gram came with that item. Here in the folder we have some really interesting items. This particular item that you're being shown is extremely rare. This is the chrome equipment that was available for the car. These are items that are optional. They were not on the standard car. You had to pay for them. You notice you can get full chrome hood louvers, full chrome grill, and my combination coupe was equipped with both. In the lower left hand corner you get what's called chrome teeth. They're really stainless steel pieces and you can get the larger bumper as was shown there. All the prices etc are given there. Again you'd have to freeze frame that to read it, but that's the chrome equipment that was available in 1939. You could really deck out your car. My combination coupe from the factory, apparently because the dealer ordered it that way, had every chrome option on it. This is a Graham Supercharger News. Graham Supercharger News was published not monthly. You would get the implication it was, it wasn't. It was published more on a bi-monthly to even tri-monthly basis. And it would tell you all the reasons why Graham was great and who was buying the cars and where they were selling, such as in India, etc. Or the invisible light invented. The invisible light was because we were approaching World War II and that's a way of keeping the light from being seen from the air. So this is an interesting publication that promotes the cars, tells you of some Graham history, where they're being sold, who might be a distributor, where the dealership might be in a foreign country, or a display of why the car doesn't tip over in that lower left on that page. So you'll see a number of things in some Graham dealerships shown and promotion regarding company executives, etc. It's very interesting to look at. This is part of the reason this particular brochure, not brochure, but Graham News, says specifically that Robert Graham 
mentions the two-door sedan being at the New York Auto Show. So I always believe that Robert probably did not lie to us that the car was actually there. And in my collection of Grams, I have now come up with two two-door sedans. The car was really manufactured. This is a look at Graham and other 1939 models and all the comparisons. It's Graham telling you why their car is better than other cars. And in all frank honesty, in many ways, the car was. Of course, we know the styling was a flop. But as far as was the performance high? Yes. Was the quality high? Yes. And at least to the French and me and a few others, the car was beautiful. There's a picture of what the factory actually looked like. The factory stood until just a few years ago when they finally tore it down, which was kind of sad. We actually have pictures of the Green Graham in front of the real factory before it was torn down, the building it was built in. Here we have a Graham approved accessories catalog. Now the accessories catalog covers every single accessory you could have gotten for your Graham, starting out with heaters. Heaters were not standard, so not surprisingly, you bought them. There's a vacuum electric shift system they offered in 1938. It was a failure, so they got rid of it. Automatic windshield washers, so I've got that on my cars. They really are real, they're vacuum operated. And there you have speedometers and clocks. The clock is not standard in standard cars. You had to buy it separate. Some of the other things being shown are fog lights, for example, and running lights. You could get snow chains. You could get yourself a spotlight. And you can see you can get the wide white wall tires for winter in particular. This particular catalog is not impossible. If I'm that chrome interpreting group is very hard. Air cleaner on the right is the standard air cleaner for the car, so you could get full chrome for your wheels with chrome discs and trim rings. It even shows you what the tool kits look like for this particular line of cars. Very interesting particular brochure. They also sold you various lubricants, polishes, etc. And in the back you have right there various combinations of equipment groups that you could buy at different prices so you could save money. Now here's something almost nobody's ever seen. This is the numerical price list for all the parts in a 1939 Gram Spirit of Motion. Everything is listed, including part numbers, codes, etc., descriptions, prices, information on how to get it. Everything is in that book. So this is the book the dealer would have had if you brought your Gram in for service, or say you were in an accident and needed a new fender, well, it's gonna be in that particular book as to what it was and how to get a hold of one and what the price was. So that's your Rampage Motors Corporation confidential price list. Only the dealer would have seen that. You never would have seen it yourself. Here we have what's called a Graham Owner's Manual. It's funny they call it the Owner's Manual. It actually isn't an Owner's Manual. We've seen that already. This is a last of the actual shop manuals published by Graham. This was published in 1937. By the time the Spirit of Motion cars were out, Graham was so poor and it put so much money in the car, they actually didn't publish a shop manual. However, almost everything on the 38, 39, and 40 Spirit of Motion cars is actually covered in a 1937 book because it didn't change that much. The outward appearance of the car changed, but the systems weren't that different, and any modified systems would have come out as a bulletin to the dealer. So here the, you're looking at, for example, how to adjust the body in 1937, in many ways similar to what you do with a 38 through 40 Ram Spirit of Motion. How to rebuild and take care of shock absorbers, how the brake system works. It also tells you how to rebuild the supercharger in here, assuming you have the fancy tools they show you. How to do your differential, how to do your engine, how to do your transmission. Everything is in here. This is what the dealer would have actually looked at. How do I repair this portion of the car? Clutches are covered, etc. Everything you would need to know to take care of that car when the, your customer brought it into your dealership, it's all in the book. As I said right there, everything with superchargers, including the list and showing you the fancy tools that nobody seems to have to work on superchargers. We've had to figure all that out with improvised items. Now 
this particular item is another thing almost nobody has. This is a real, original 1939 color chip book that the dealer would have had and been able to show you the colors. He could order your gram in. It shows you both the base color as well as striping colors, tells you what wheel colors, etc. were available. And the actual combination numbers, these are stamped on the floor plate on the rear floor passenger side of a gram in 1938 through 40. And you can find exactly what's supposed to be together. And you can read your paint code and you say, oh, that's what it looks like. But these are the real chips and amazingly, they're in pretty darn good shape. Obviously we keep this book out of sunlight so you can see what they actually look like. Now this is another thing that most people would never have seen. This is a real Graham Salesman Data Handbook. Notice this is from 1939. This is so that the salesman would hopefully take this home and study it and be able to answer all the questions that could ever possibly come up by his customer. Also, if he really was forgetful and hadn't done his homework, which wouldn't be good for a Graham salesman, by the way, they did teach class to them, he could actually look it up. They had a very serious class in selling the cars run by Robert Graham from the top down and they did classes both at regional and local and right at the dealer level to make sure the salesmen were actually knowledgeable of the cars and you were expected as a salesman to do what was called prospecting. It was your job to get customers into the dealership. You didn't just stand at the front door like they do nowadays, you actually got people in. Just a little review as we throw them out in front of you. We hope you like the video. Stop it as you need, look at the stuff in depth. And we'd appreciate it if you'd like and subscribe, and we look forward to you in a future video.